In this video, we are going to discuss top 10 deep learning interview questions that are often asked in deep learning interviews. This is part of our ongoing interview question series where we are releasing new videos every week. So do not forget to subscribe to our channel to see the latest videos in your YouTube feed. On that note, let's begin. This first question asks, what is a neuron in a neural network? Okay, a neuron is the fundamental unit of uh, information processing in a neural network. In simple words, think of it as a tiny brain cell working alongside countless others to solve a complex problem. Now, how does a neuron work? It has uh, three steps basically, input, processing, followed by output. Under inputs, imagine a neuron with multiple branches like dendrites reaching out. These are the inputs receiving signals from other neurons or raw data from the outside world. Now, each input has a weight determining its influence on the neuron's output. Then comes processing. An activation function combines and uh, transforms the weighted input inside the neuron. This function acts like a gatekeeper, deciding how much the neuron fires based on the sum of its inputs. Different activation functions have different properties, impacting how sensitive the neuron is to its inputs and what information it can process. Finally, output, if the process signal surpasses a certain threshold, the neuron fires and sends an output signal along its exon. Other neurons can receive this uh, output signal as an input, creating a chain reaction of information processing through the network. Let's move on to the next question now. In this question, we'll discuss what types of data are used in deep learning. Well, the diverse world of deep learning uh, uses various kinds of data. And you know what? Each data type brings their own challenges and advantages. So what are these data types? First is numerical data type, which includes temperature reading, stock prices, or height, where values flow smoothly across a range. Next is discrete, which encompasses data like uh, number of uh, siblings, movie ratings, or shoe sizes with uh, distinct separate values. Third is text data, which includes articles, reviews, social media posts, and even books that uh, offer a treasure trove of uh, textual information for tasks like sentiment analysis, language translation, and text summarization. Fourth is images, which has uh, photographs and uh, medical scans to satellite imagery and artwork. Fifth is audio data. Deep learning model can analyze music, speech recordings, and sound effects for music genre classification, speech recognition, and anomaly detection in audio streams. Sixth is time series data. This includes uh, sensor readings, financial transactions, website traffic, and even weather data that forms sequences of data points over time. Deep learning can extract meaningful patterns from these sequences for forecasting, anomaly detection, and trend analysis. Finally, multimodal data, which combines different data types into one. For example, deep learning can analyze uh, video reviews of restaurants where uh, you would leverage audio and visual information for sentiment analysis and uh, content understanding. Let us move to the next question now. This question asks, what are epochs and batches in deep learning? Well, epochs and batches are like the gears and pistons of deep learning training. They work together to drive the model towards better performance. Let's see how they fit into the training process. So what is epoch? In deep learning, an epoch is like reading through the entire training dataset once. In simple terms, imagine this as a complete reading marathon of your favorite book. The model sees every data point and adjusts its internal parameter or weights based on what it learns. During an epoch, the model calculates each data point's error or uh, the difference between its predictions and actual values and then back propagates it to update its weights. Additionally, completing multiple epochs allow the model to refine its understanding of the data and improve its accuracy iteratively. Now let us look at what batches are. In deep learning, a batch is a smaller subset of the training data used to update the model's weights during an epoch. In other words, imagine reading your uh, favorite book chapter by chapter instead of all at once. Training the batches is uh, faster and more efficient than using the entire dataset simultaneously, especially when you are dealing with large datasets. Moreover, it also allows the model to learn more uh, frequently different aspects of the data. 
The size of the batch or the number of uh, data points is a hyperparameter which you can tune to optimize your model's performance. Smaller batches might take uh, longer to train but can help avoid overfitting, while larger batches might train faster but are uh, prone to overfitting. At this point, let's move on to the next question. This question asks the difference between supervised and unsupervised learning. Now, supervised learning involves training a model with labeled data where inputs and corresponding correct outputs are provided. This is like having a teacher guiding you through examples. You can use it for uh, predictive tasks like classification and regression, and it requires large labeled data. On the other hand, unsupervised learning works with the uh, unlabeled data, meaning only input without specified outputs are provided. This is like exploring patterns on your own without guidance from a teacher. It aims to identify patterns or structures in the data and is uh, used for clustering, association, and dimensionality reduction. It doesn't need labeled data, but finding accurate patterns can be more challenging. We have made a list of uh, the differences between supervised and unsupervised learning in the slide number one and slide number two. You may take a screenshot of uh, these differences. Uh, now let's move on to the next question. This question asks about the differences between activation functions like rectified linear unit or ReLU and sigmoid. Additionally, when should we use which one is the second part of this question. The primary difference between uh, ReLU and sigmoid activation functions lies in their mathematical formula and the way they transform input signals. But first, let us understand them individually. ReLU outputs uh, the input if it's positive or zero otherwise. It's widely used in deep learning due to its computational efficiency and ability to reduce the vanishing gradient problem, which is common in deep learning networks. ReLU is often the default choice for uh, hidden layers in various types of neural networks. Then comes sigmoid. Sigmoid, on the other hand, uh, maps any input to a value between zero and one this characteristic makes it uh, suitable for uh, output layers in binary classification task where the output is interpreted as a probability. Now you may wonder when to use uh, which one? Well, ReLU's general use uh, is in hidden layers due to its efficiency and uh, effectiveness in avoiding the vanishing gradient problem. It's suitable for uh, most types of neural networks, including deep learning models. And sigmoid is used when the output layer for a binary classification task interprets the output as a probability. So in simple words, no matter how big or small the number is, the sigmoid function turns it into a value that shows how likely something is going to happen. It's less preferred in hidden layers because of its susceptibility to the vanishing gradient problem, especially in deep networks. Let's move on to the next question. This question asks us to define the process of backpropagation. Well, backpropagation is a fundamental algorithm used to train neural networks. In other words, this is like adjusting how to learn from your mistakes. When you make a mistake, you figure out how much you were off by and then go back to tweak your understanding, improving your overall performance over time. It consists of two main phases, the forward pass and the backward pass. Let's have a look at uh, these now. The first is the forward pass. In this phase, the input data is passed through the network layer by layer from the input layer to the output layer. At each layer, the activation function passes the inputs to produce outputs, which then becomes input for the next layer. The final output calculates the loss, measuring the difference between the network's prediction and the target values. Then comes a backward pass. This is when backpropagation comes into play. The goal is to minimize the loss by adjusting the network's weights and biases. Starting from the output layer, the network propagates uh, the loss backwards. Using the calculus chain rule, we compute the loss gradient concerning uh, each weight and bias. This tells us how much a small change in each weight and bias would affect the loss. Now, let's move on to the next question. In this question, we'll look at uh, various types of optimization algorithms used in deep learning and the one that is best for training convolutional neural networks or CNNs. In deep learning, several optimization algorithms are uh, commonly used, each with the uh, strength and uh, its respective applications. These are the names of the popular ones. The first is uh, gradient descent, which is the foundation uh, optimization algorithm. The second is stochastic gradient descent or SGD, that is a variant of gradient descent. Third is mini batch gradient descent. This balances between batch and stochastic versions, updating parameters with a subset of training data at each step. Fourth is uh, momentum, uh, which is an extension of SGD. Fifth is adagrad, 
सिक्स्थ इज आर एम एस प्रॉप एंड सेवन्थ इज एडम और अडेप्टिव मोमेंट एस्टिमेशन ना लेटर सी विच ऑप्टिमाइजेशन एल्गोरिदम इज बेस्ट फॉर कॉन्वोल्यूशनल न्यूरल नेटवर्क और सी एन एस फॉर ट्रेनिंग सी एन एस एडम इज ओफन कंसिडर द बेस्ट चॉइस ड्यू टू इट्स रॉबस्टनेस एंड अफेक्टिवनेस अक्रॉस अ वाइड रेंज ऑफ टास्क हावेवर एच जी डी विद मोमेंटम इज ऑल्सो अ पॉपुलर चॉइस स्पेशली इन केसेज वेयर फाइन ग्रेन कंट्रोल ओवर द लर्निंग प्रोसेस इज डिजायर्ड सच एज इन केस ऑफ डीप लर्निंग नेटवर्क और नेटवर्क विद अ कॉम्प्लेक्स स्ट्रक्चर The choice of optimizer can depend on the specific task, the size and nature of data, and uh, the architecture of the CNN itself. Empirical testing and hyperparameter tuning are often essential to determine the best optimizer for a specific use case. At this point, let's move on to the next question. This question asks about the advantages and disadvantages of using dropout in deep learning models. But before answering this question, let us understand what dropout is. Dropout is a widely used regularization technique in deep learning models. It is uh, a regularization technique for uh, reducing overfitting in neural networks by preventing complex co-adaptations on training data. In simple words, dropout is a regularization technique in deep learning where during training random neurons are temporarily ignored. This prevents the model from uh, relying too much on a specific neuron. making it more adaptable robust and less likely to overfit the training data it is a very very efficient uh, way of uh, performing model averaging with neural networks the advantages of uh, dropout is that it prevents overfitting dropout reduces overfitting by randomly deactivating a subset of uh, neurons during training then dropout helps in improving the generalization capabilities of the model as well it also increases the model performance especially in complex networks prone to overfitting finally each training iteration with the dropout can be seen as uh, training a different model at uh, test time it's like averaging the predictions of all these models akin to an ensemble model now let us look at the disadvantages of dropout first as uh, dropout involves training a different subset of uh, neurons in each iteration it may increase the time required to train the model effectively second dropout uh, reduces model capacity the network's uh, effective capacity is reduced by randomly dropping neurons uh, during training plus the dropout rate is an uh, additional hyperparameter to tune an appropriate uh, rate can lead to underfitting or overfitting plus the randomness introduced by dropout can lead to variations in model performance and it may not always be beneficial finally sometimes dropout might not be necessary and uh, could hinder performance this is all about this particular question now let us move on to the next one well this question asks about the concepts of overfitting and underfitting and how you can prevent them First let us see what overfitting is. Overfitting occurs when a model learns from the training data too well, including its noises and outliers. It fits the underlying uh, pattern and the random fluctuations in the training data. Now the issue here is that uh, such a model performs well on training data but poorly on unseen data or test data because it has memorized the training data very well rather than learning to generalize. Now how to prevent overfitting? it could be prevented by various techniques like regularization dropout data augmentation and early stopping next comes underfitting underfitting helps when a model is too simple to learn the underlying patterns in data resulting in poor training and test data performance this occurs when the model doesn't have enough capacity not enough layers or nodes that is or is not trained sufficiently but there are many ways uh, to prevent underfitting uh, you can do that by increasing model complexity training the model longer by feature engineering and also reducing regularization at this point let's move on to the next question this question asks what are the different types of uh, regularization techniques in deep learning but let us understand why we need regularization first of all regularization is an unavoidable and important step to improve the model prediction and uh, reduce errors moreover regularization helps reduce the possibility of overfitting and help us obtain an optimal model and these are few of the regularization techniques we have uh, discussed here they are l1 regularization which is lasso l2 regularization which is ridge elastic net regularization dropout early stopping batch normalization data augmentation noise injection reducing model complexity and finally weight constraints you may take a screenshot of these two slides so guys that's all we had for you today 
If you have any more questions, let us know in the comment section and we'll get back to you. Do not forget to subscribe to our channel for more interesting data tech content. Goodbye and happy prepping.